Hello, welcome back to HackMyControlSystem.com. My name is Nate. In this episode, I'll show you how to manipulate Modbus coils and registers, as well as how to detect and prevent these modifications. However, before we can proceed, we need to explain some terminology. Generally speaking, data is saved in, or more accurately written to, block addresses. A DABA table, and there's four in total, holds 9,999 addresses each. Each data table is specific to its type of input or the data that's stored in it. The first set of addresses are for coils. Coils house a single bit, one or zero, meaning true or false. You may hear this referred to as bool or boolean. These block addresses are read writable and can be modified by toggling the bit on or off, which makes them great for digital inputs and outputs. The next data table, also used for digital input and output, is for discrete inputs which are read-only and can only contain a single bit. Unlike coils, discrete inputs are read-only. Input registers are also read-only, but as the name suggests, the register holds 16 bits or 2 bytes, which is one word. You may be familiar with the concept of registers if you spent any time with an assembly or writing shellcode. The high or low order bits positions are not absolute and subject to the manufacturer, however big endian addressing is most common. The final data table is holding registers. It also supports 16 bits, but like coils, it's also writable. Both register fields are often found in analog input output. In order to pull or modify a block address, you need to send the command to the server or slave. As mentioned earlier, these commands are referred to as function codes and are contained within the first field of the PDU distinguished in the slide by the green squares. Some of the more popular function codes are listed on the bottom right diagram. This includes function code 1, recoil, bit status, function code 2, read input status, uh, function code 5, write single coil status, and we have some other write function codes such as 6, 15, and 16. We'll be focusing on class zero codes, which are generally considered the bare minimum for a useful Modbus device, as they give a master the ability to read from or write to the data model. So far, we have used software running in a virtual environment for all of our testing, with the exception of an Arduino. Let's up the ante by adding in some hardware, specifically the Web Switch Remote Power Switch. It will serve as our Modbus server, which is Modbus TCP speak for slave, and operates on TCP port 502. One of the key takeaways of this video is that once the device is identified, don't just start sending it arbitrary packets. Instead, review the documentation. Within the web switch manual, we can see that it supports the following function codes and addresses. If we want to see that state of the first outlet, we send a recoil or function code 1 address 0 request to the web switch. For outlet 2, we simply change the address to 1. To change the state of an outlet, we issue a write single coil or function code 05. By default, the web switch has an IP address of 192.168.1.2. Um, but let's go ahead and use the Modbus scanner get function if we look at the options we can set our r host to and i will pick on our modbus pal instance and then we can go ahead uh, uid is currently none but it's required we know that, right? So let's go ahead and set our UID to 1. That's uh, that's what it responded back with. A difference between the auxiliary modules or the modules within SMOD and Metasploit is SMOD, you must absolutely type in exploit. You can't use run as a substitution. Otherwise, um, you'll have to reset the whole module again. So be very cognizant that you type in exploit. And watch what happens uh, when I run exploit with a UID of 1. We get a padding error and a bunch of code and what's going on here. However, if I set it to 0 and rerun it, it functions normally. 
and we can see that function code zero is probably supported. One is probably supported. Two. You can use control Z to uh, stop. And what are the tools we have? Let's go to MBT get kind of an old standby, if you will. And the actual binary is located in the scripts file. Excellent. So what we're going to do now is actually start issuing a few of the function codes to different devices to see what will happen. I'm going to specify a function code one recoil one bit status. I want to see four addresses. And we're going to go ahead and use that web switch. And we see that address zero and address one both have uh, a value, a coil value of one bit, meaning they're both on. We could change this to read input status, and we see we have nothing there. Additionally, if we would issue a function code three, which is read holding registers, it fails with an exception code two. And the reason why is because this particular model uh, doesn't have registers. There's another model, um, same form factor, but a little additional code. Um, the code actually allows you to get more information, diagnostic information, temperature values, things like that. Uh, so we don't have that, so it doesn't work. Now what if we would try the same type of command, except except instead of showing us four um, four values, let's just go ahead and enumerate all twenty, and probably want to start at address zero, and then let's specify Modbus Pal. All right, we have a coil set. Interesting. Now that was recoil one bit status. Let's see what the input status is. Hmm, got an exception. You know why? Because we didn't configure any in Modbus Pal. How about registers though? Hey, we see some values. And if you remember, we had configured the Modbus Pal. Let's go ahead and wake this guy back up as a voltage regulator. And within it, the holding registers, we have four values. The rest are zero. Here, I'll prove it. Address one is a randomized input voltage. Two is our output voltage. Three is minimum output voltage. Four is max output voltage. So what does this say? It says this should just shoot up an alarm if the input voltage is higher than uh, 120, being our max output voltage, it should also send an alarm if it's under 110. So very similar to what we saw before, right? Notice uh, the address one, two, and three. However, address zero is randomized. How do I know that? Well, we can continue doing this and let me shore up the amount of addresses we show. Excellent. We see address zero is our input register. The rest are configured as essentially levels. Now we can also see what the coil values are. Starting with address zero of our Raspberry Pi honeypot. And we got an exception. Interesting. And the reason is Conpot's address starts at not 0000, but 0001. Let's go ahead and change that. And now we see values. Hmm. Let's increase it to 30. Any changes? Man, they look pretty static, don't they? Interesting. 
So now we've been able to identify which, essentially, which address spaces, which coils or registers we can actually interact with. We can see which values by either for quick enough, just you know, refreshing, we can see which values change over time. And that's going to help us identify which could be particular analog measurements versus which are digital, right? The next couple of examples are an update to this video as I found some additional numeration scripts that look quite promising. The first suite of tools I'll be presenting is the Modbus Exploitation Tool Kit. Let's enumerate our instance of Conpot. We'll go ahead and call our MB enumeration Python script, provided a target IP of Compot. We see that this tool will first start off enumerating the unit IDs as well as provide us with some device information. Look at its config file to identify any known vulnerabilities. And then lastly, we'll start enumerating the actual coils. I found though by running this script against Compot that it will eventually pre uh, create some issues and we'll crash the program. We can use the same tool to enumerate two coils on the web switch. We'll invoke our Python script, provide it the target IP of the web switch, prompt for two values, and then specify read coils. We can do the same or use the same tool to read the holding registers of our Modbus PAL voltage regulator just by specifying the IP address of our voltage regulator or VM, requesting a count of four values, and then we'll specify RHR for read holding registers, give it a start address of zero and a unit ID of one. Here's a Python script that makes enumeration of holding registers quite easy. Read all holding registers dot pi. Let's go ahead and invoke that with our Python interpreter. Give it a start address of zero and an end address of five. We'll send this over TCP port 502. And lastly, specify our Modbus PAL voltage regulator. Another interesting script that I found is Live Monitor, written in Ruby. It will enumerate our registers, but also calls out which ones change. Let's go ahead and call our Ruby interpreter, provide it the Live Monitor Ruby script and then specify the IP address of our Modbus PAL. We see it reading the registers, and then as Modbus PAL randomizes the input voltage, we are prompted within the tool, which is a fantastic way of identifying which particular registers are static or dynamic. I recommend compiling your findings prior to moving on to the attack phase of the assessment. By now we should have the following details. IP address, whether IPv4 or IPv6. MAC address, if it's on the same segment, otherwise this would be a router address or even one of those protocol gateways. 
protocol. This can be many things that we discussed earlier. Modbus TCP, Modbus over TCP, Modbus over UDP, Modbus RTUIP, etc. Port number. For TCP, we'll use 502. We then can list the supported function codes and addresses, including the coils and holding register addresses. So I'm going to go ahead and use another auxiliary module located within our auxiliary scanner SCADA. And this one is Modbus Client. We're going to set our R host to the web switch. We're also going to set our port to the Modbus port, TCP 502. And what other options do we have? Do, 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 do. Unit number one, well that seems to be good because we already identified earlier uh, that the unit ID was one, so that's fantastic. We also have a command set called actions. Since this is a client, allows us to do certain things. Um, let's go ahead and interact with the Modbus, uh, or excuse me, with, interact with the web switch. So I'm going to go ahead and set the action as read coils. Now I'm going to double check my options. And we see the next required value is data addresses or Modbus data address. Perfect. So let's set that data address. And we had two coils, right? We had 0000 and 0001. So let's go ahead and enumerate the value out of zero first. Run that bad boy. And it returns a value of one. All right. So let's increment. Get another one. All right. That's what we expected. How about two? Ooh, no values there and three just to do four values and call it even all right so we see that we have two coils that we can actually interact with um, one of which is located under address zero the other is an address one now if you remember in our web switch hmi we have two outlets both are on let's go ahead and interact with one of these guys I'm going to go ahead and show my actions. And this time, instead of reading coils, let's write a coil. Not two multiple coils, not multiple bits, I should say, to several coils, but a single value. And let's set that action to write coil. What options do we got? All right, we have our address. Let's set the data to write, or let's set our data address to 0001. Let's verify that with the show options. Perfect. Now we need to set some data to it. So let's set the data to zero, right? If you remember the, the lecture, um, you know, it's Boolean, one on, zero off, etc. All right, verify our options. Looks good. And let's execute. And I heard a pop. So if I bring up our web switch, I see that outlet two is off. How about let's change it back? And give me a second to reorganize my screen space here. Show options. Set data one. Run. And we successfully manipulated a single coil.
Now let's go back to our Modbus. And under Modbus platform, um, we went ahead and let's look at the single registers, uh, addresses 0 uh, to 3. And if you recall, we have three set values and we have one that is randomized. I'm just kind of, you know, refreshing, etc. Fantastic. So let's modify one of these address registers to see what it does or see how it impacts. So let's go ahead and uh, go back to MBT get. Instead of reading function code, let's do write single register function code W6. We have to specify the value. Now this is, you know, spoil the uh, surprise, right? This is 110 volts AC. Let's crank that thing up to 11 or at least to 20. And we'll specify the address of three. And then we'll give it the IP address. And let's execute. And word write OK. Well, that's nice of it. So what happened? Well, now we have 220 set to address 3. We refresh it. We see we still have the randomization. And let's go ahead and verify in our victim that now the max output voltage had been set to 220. Great. We're nice people, so we could obviously set that back. Just to mess with a poor technician trying to find out what happened. And go back. Hey, it looks good. Verify. And there we have it. As a consequence of our testing, we were able to enumerate which addresses and function codes were supported on the web switch. You should come to expect that not all tools will be all things to all people or all machines. You may run into situations where you're unable to download or upload compile software into the target network. One way to circumvent these restrictions is to learn how to write your own programs. Devote time to understanding either a high-level interpreter language such as Python or even a low-level programming language, for example, assembly. In this example, I have the web switch HMI up and running. Now let's review some nasty Python code that I whipped up in a few minutes using PyModBus documentation. The first line just calls the Python interpreter. We then import uh, some uh, uh, functions, libraries and functions, for example, PyModBus, um, sys. Um, I have a leftover here. We'll go ahead and remove that. And then we uh, establish the connection um, with the client. We accept a system argument in the command line, which will be the target IP address, and we've hard-coded Modbus port 502. Once the connection is set up, we then write coil to the first address, and we pass it the value of zero, boolean for false. Once we wrote um, the data into the coils, we then want to read that value, and we go ahead and grab the first, um, the first address, the first bit, um, and then we go ahead and print that out and close the connection. So I'll go ahead and call our interpreter, followed by our script, then pass it the IP address of the web switch. As you can see in the left-hand screen, the outlet is on. Let's go ahead and launch. We see we get back zero in return, and in fact, the outlet has turned off. Excellent. We will return back to the web switch and turn the first coil off via a write coil command. Let's call our Python interpreter to Modbus send Python script Specify a target IP of the web switch. Say that we want to provide it with a false or zero value, the address of zero, 
and then specify right coil. Let's execute that command and see the output of our web switch HMI. So how does one detect this type of attack? Well, one of the low impact ways is to passively inspect the traffic. Uh, to receive the traffic, you could either, let's say, um, send it over a switch via R-SPAN. Uh, maybe you have an inline tap, such as a Gigamon, that will forward the traffic out of band for inspection, or even connect all the devices to a network hub. We're going to talk about uh, network security in a subsequent video series, but just know there's a lot of uh, factors that go into making a, consider, uh, making a decision on how you're going to inspect this traffic. At a bare minimum, we're talking you know, network throughput, um, your interface type and count, uh, duplex, the speed, um, environmental conditions, and the industrial environment, etc. So a lot of factors go into that. Since we're talking about, in this scenario, a non-production lab environment, you can simply just take a workspace, a workstation, throw three NICs into it, network interface cards, one for inbound, one for outbound, and a dedicated management uh, network interface card, and then send your traffic through it onto your testing device. For an intrusion detection system, or IDS, I'm going to focus on Snort. Although you cyber guys and gals can feel free to use Suricata, Snort has added Modbus and DMP3 preprocessors since January 2012. It utilizes these protocol-specific preprocessors to detect irregular packets or assist in their decoding and inspection. As a result, you can expect faster performance than traditional signature inspection. Alternatively, we could import DigitalBond's Modbus preprocessor, which I leave as an exercise to you. We will not simply discount DigitalBond, though, as we will use their detection rules written in Snort's signature format, which could supercharge our detection efforts. Let's take a quick look at what one of their Snort signatures look like. On the bottom, you'll see a Modbus TCP force listen only mode signature. Let me walk you through each field of a Snort signature. We have an action field, which tells us whether to allow the packet, drop the packet, or log the packet. Here we are simply alerting or logging the packet. Next we have the protocol, in this case TCP. Variables are denoted by the dollar sign. Here we are saying inspect TCP packets coming from those addresses we have specified as Modbus clients or masters. If this type of behavior contained within the signature was unwanted, I would simply change dollar sign Modbus underscore client to any. The any following the variables represents this TCP source port. We see the direction arrow, meaning this packets, uh, these packets are coming from a TCP Modbus client and are being sent to another variable, which is the Modbus server or slaves listening on TCP port 502. I will quickly skip over the rest just to get, just to get the erroneous fields out of the way. We can read that the signature author wants us to go to their digital bond URL and they classified this signature as being an attempted denial of service. The SID or SNORT ID is a number assigned to the signature. Custom non-Cisco SourceFire signature IDs should be numbered over 10,000. I like to keep an eye on the revision number as it tells us how many times there were modifications or possibly when an issue was observed with this particular signature. Signatures with many, many revisions suggest that the protocol or the content is quite dynamic, thus increasing its chances for false positives or even false negatives. The priority field is just an integer value denoting its severity. It's based on the class type, and its default set of values can be changed in the classification.config file. Otherwise, just modify the signature in the rules, in the rules file. The SID, or SNORT ID, is a number assigned to the signature. Custom non-Cisco SourceFire signature IDs should be numbered over 10,000. I like to keep an eye on the revision number as it tells us how many times there are modifications or possibly when an issue was observed with that signature. Signatures with many, many revisions suggest the protocol or content is quite dynamic, thus increasing its chances for false positives or false negatives. 
The priority field is just an integer, denoting its severity. It's based on the class type, and its default set of values can be changed in the classification.config file. Otherwise, just modify the signature in the rules file. So what is the signature for? A semantic report states that an attacker can force a PLC into listen-only mode by issuing a 08 diagnostics function code with a subfunction code of 04, representing force listen-only mode. Essentially, this places the PLC in an active state and creates a denial of service event. Remember, the attacker doesn't necessarily need to compromise the system, rather prevent functioning or simply degrade its ability to perform. The signature detects the bytes listed in the bottom right Modbus TCP IP ADU. I have broken up the PDU from the TCP MBAP header. The first thing the signature checks is that the flow or direction of travel comes from the client or master variable object. It then moves its inspection pointer, two bytes to the right, which moves past the transaction identifier. It then says to inspect a depth of two bytes thus matching the protocol identifier to what's listed in the signature's content field. The content field is looking for two null bytes. As per the Modbus organization's Modbus implementation guide, zero is reserved for the Modbus protocol, so the signature is verifying that this packet is a Modbus packet. The pointer then moves back to the beginning, which is simplistic but not optimal with regards to performance, but moves seven bytes inward, placing it past the unit ID. It then compares the next three bytes, which is the Modbus PDU, containing the function code and data fields. It then matches it with a diagnostic function code of 8 and a sub, uh, subcode for force listen only mode. If the signature matches, it logs the packet, sends an alert, and displays what's in the message field, SCADA IDS, Modbus TCP, force listen only mode. Now that you are briefly familiar with SNORT signature syntax, use SNORT to review the NetResSec and Digital Bond CTF capture files we spoke of in the last episode. The command syntax is really simple. Although we didn't cover it in today's episode, note that there are two other ways to pass Modbus. We can encapsulate Modbus over UDP or pass the serial Modbus RTU over IP itself. Know what's in your environment, especially if you're going to be creating SNORT signatures. It's time once again to cover the key takeaways from a cybersecurity perspective. Preventing unwanted mo modifications to your Modbus servers requires an ICS firewall or intrusion prevention system in front of your Modbus devices. At a minimum, implementing an intrusion detection system can at least alert upon th this undesired activity, allowing you to respond in kind. Additional security without centralized logging and monitoring is just checking the compliance checkbox. OT should work with IT who already have the means to store and monitor logs. IT needs to educate OT on the benefits of Splunk, NetFlow, IP IPFix, port security, and configuration management tools. In order to secure your Modbus networks, you must do your homework. Test your devices safely in a lab not in production. Perform the same techniques we've so far demonstrated, determine what is normal, and establish a baseline. Once you have a baseline, it's much easier to identify an anomaly or unwanted behavior. Although there have been published works around a secure Modbus protocol, I highly doubt we will see it anytime soon. Since Modbus was made an open standard, IoT developers will continue to build solutions using non-licensed works and will continue to write in secure code. It's cheap, cost-effective, and agile. As such, consider migrating from Modbus as it's trivial to exploit. Look at alternatives, IEC 61850MMS or DMP3 Secure. So that concludes this episode. We enumerated and changed Modbus coil and register values, showed how easy it is to con conduct a denial of service attack, and inspected traffic with Snort. In the next episode, we'll cover fuzzing the Modbus protocol and hardware. We thank you for your viewing and ask that you subscribe by pressing the subscribe link below. Lastly, please note that we have listed our references in our show notes.